All right. Hey, um, we, we had the privilege to go to Cleveland this past week, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I learned that it's the second poorest city in the, in the United States, actually. Lots of immigrants from Afghanistan and Congo, and we got to minister with them and minister to the kids and move dirt and paint walls and move stuff out of buildings. And it, it was a great time. It really was a fantastic trip. So thanks for being a part of this church family and supporting that trip. I know many of you probably supported the kids, the high school kids that went in that trip. So great time, great time. We're moving right along with this series called Healthy Hearts. And today is part four of Healthy Hearts. And the word heart, as we've said the last few weeks, comes from this Hebrew word lebe, which means it's the seat of emotion. So if you could picture your heart being a chair or a seat, your emotions live there. And it's the seat of positive emotions as well as negative emotions. And we've been talking mostly about negative emotions. And we've said that when we are sort of tagged with these emotions, whether it's guilt or shame or anger or jealousy, that we're tempted to do three things. And I've called these the three killer Bs. The first thing we're tempted to do is to just blame right? It's your fault that I'm this way. It's your fault because you're always late. It's your fault that our marriage is such a struggle. It's your fault that we struggle financially. And you know as well as I do that blaming never works. And the only person that you can really change is yourself. The second killer B is behave, right? It's like, I'm just going to kind of, you know, close my mouth. I'm not going to say anything. And I'm just going to behave. Like right now in this room, right? If you just look around, everybody in the room is behaving, right? Everyone's sitting in rows. You're all looking at me. And, you, you know, you can behave even though your mind might be somewhere else all together, except for right now, because I just called you out for your mind being somewhere else all together. But we can, we can behave for a season, right? For a moment. And then you get home and the filters fall off and, and you just start saying stuff. And it's like, whoa, I didn't, I didn't know you were like that because you're different than you were publicly or you're different than you were at work. So behaving doesn't work. And then the third thing that we're tempted to do is to just bow out, right? It's like, hey, that's just who I am. That's who my dad was. That's who his dad was. I've tried to get counseling. I've even prayed about it by saying, oh God, change my heart, oh God, make it ever new. Change my heart, oh God, may it be just like you. And none of it worked. So you're just gonna have to deal with me. And some of you have a spouse like that and it is oh so much fun, isn't it? When your spouse just bows out and says, you just gotta deal with me. Now, Jesus said, because Jesus is so smart, right? And at one point he said this, the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. So we should just get rid of the following statement. Sorry, I didn't mean that. Because the truth is, you did mean it, you just didn't mean to say it, because it actually came out of your heart. And if you don't tend your heart, if you don't guard your heart, eventually it's going to come out of your mouth. And so 3,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, Solomon, who was one of the wisest men on earth, people would come from far and wide to sit at the, seat of, uh, at the feet of Solomon to glean from his wisdom. And he wrote a lot. He wrote Proverbs, wrote Ecclesiastes, wrote all these, these wisdom literature. He said this, above all else, meaning this is the most important thing that I have to share with you, right? Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. You need to tend to your heart. You need to guard it. You need to keep your heart because if you don't keep it clean, if you don't make sure it's healthy, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out and it's going to spew all over the place. And we want to be people who produce refreshment, not bitter water. So the, the question is, well, how do you guard your heart? What does it mean to guard your heart? So we've looked at several emotions. In week one, we talked about guilt right? Guilt is simply I owe you. It could be something as simple as, I stole $100 from you, and I feel guilty about it. Or I stole your childhood, because as your dad, I was never around, and now I feel guilty about it, right? Or I stole a good marriage from you, or I worked for you for a time, and I wasn't a very good worker, or I cheated financially, and now I feel guilty about it. As we talked about during that sermon, guilt can actually transition to anger, and the way that you guard your heart against guilt, the way that you tend your heart, there's only one way to do it, and it's to confess. It's to say those words that we hate saying, I am sorry for 
hurting you. That's how you guard your heart against guilt. Last week, John O'Neill talked about envy or jealousy, which is, let's be honest, jealousy is God owes me, right? Because God gave you talented kids, and God gave you a bigger house and a bigger truck and bigger, stronger, faster. God owes me now, right? And so we can walk around with green eyes and jealousy, and the, the only way that you break jealousy is to celebrate other people. There's that verse that says, mourn with those who mourn or grieve with those who grieve, which some of us are really good at kind of putting our arm around people who are hurting. But the second part of that is even harder that says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Celebrate other people's success. And when you do that, you'll start to see greed get out of your heart. Well, today, we're gonna talk about the emotion of greed. Okay? And here's the definition of greed. Greed is, I owe me. Because after all, I worked hard for it, I earned it, and whatever comes in my hands is for me. Right? It's all mine. And I'm greedy. Now, here's the thing about greed, and this, this is so interesting. Greed actually disguises itself. It's hard to see greed in the mirror. Right? And <clears throat> I've been in full-time ministry for 24 years. I have never one time had people come up to me and say, hey, Dave, can you pray for me because I'm really struggling with greed? I've never had it happen. I've had people say, pray for me because I'm struggling with anger, even jealousy. Never had anybody say, you know what? I'm struggling with greed and I need you because it, it disguises itself. It's hard to see in the mirror. And we'll put a spiritual spin on it by saying, I'm not greedy, I'm just thrifty right? Or I'm not greedy. I prefer to save. And besides, Jesus saves, right? So we kind of could have put, put a spiritual. It took you a minute to get that, didn't you? Here's the thing about greed, and you know this, that greed is like an appetite. The more you feed it, the more it grows. How many of you know that when you eat a lot of food for a week, like I did this past week, you're, you don't say to yourself, oh, I'm good for another three weeks, right? Because the more you feed yourself, your appetite grows and you just want more of it. That's why you need to nip greed in the bud because the more greedy you get, the more you assume that everything that comes into my hands is for me, the bigger it gets. So here's the, the, the big question that I want you to think about for a minute. How do you know if you're greedy? Because again, don't show, show up in the mirror, disguise itself. How do you know if you're greedy, well, I have, a, I have a few sort of diagnostic questions you can ask yourself. Number one, if you're someone who's like, I just always need more. I need bigger, stronger, faster, better. I, I just feel like I always need to upgrade. You might, you might have an issue with greed. How about this one? You're just you're reluctant to share. Like you got that shiny thing, and you do not want that thing going anywhere near anybody else. You are reluctant to share it because if it gets a ding on it, you're just going to kind of fall apart. Or giving your money away, it's just hard because after all, you earned it, right? The cousin of greed, as we said, is jealousy because like, man, I just got to have higher and better and, you know, you, you get that whole feeling. Here's the other thing about greed. Greedy people rarely say thank you because why would I tell you thank you when I deserve that? Why would I tell you thank you if I earned it? Now, let me say this about greed. Every single person in this room struggles with greed at one level or another. And the reason that you might not think you struggle with greed is because your heart has deceived you and because there's always somebody else who's got something bigger, stronger, faster, shinier. And we tend to compare ourselves with other people. And when we look at somebody else, we're like, well, I don't, even when I was preparing this message, like full disclosure, there were people that were coming to my mind like, oh, I think he's greedy. I think he's greedy because we don't see it in ourselves. And here's the thing about greed, that it always leads to discontentment. It always leads to a place where you're just not really happy and you're not peaceful. So, you struggle with greed and I struggle with greed. So how do we guard our hearts from greed? That's what we're gonna talk about this morning. So, we're gonna be in Luke chapter 12. This is an extraordinary passage. It's, it's so good. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, a really, really intense passage. And it starts out, Luke, who followed the Apostle Paul around the Mediterranean world and 
thoroughly investigated the stories of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and eventually wrote it down. And here we are 2,000 years later being blessed because Luke recorded this episode in the life of Jesus. Here's how he starts it out in Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak. Now, you've probably been to a sporting event or a concert where there are thousands of people and you're like, oh my goodness, I think somebody's gonna die. I think somebody's gonna get trampled. There are so many people. And this is typical for Jesus's ministry. Every time Jesus showed up in the neighborhood, the whole neighborhood showed up because they're like, this guy can preach. And we're used to hearing the religious leaders preach and they're not very good, but Jesus preaches with authority and maybe we'll get to see a miracle and maybe Jesus will actually feed us because I heard he feeds people. So you got all these people showing up and Jesus gives some of the most intense teachings that are recorded in the gospel of Luke. He talks about hypocrisy and he's like, don't be like the Pharisees. He talks about hell. It's getting really, really intense. And he says this, anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And everybody who hears that in the crowd that day, they're like, I have no idea what that means, but I don't want to do it because I don't want to be unforgiven. But Jesus doesn't explain it. He just moves on. And he goes, when you are brought before the synagogues, the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. Notice he doesn't say if. Jesus is like, if you want to follow me, Like, yeah, even you back there, like the thousandth person, if you want to follow me, you're probably going to end up before the authorities and you might go to prison. But the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. So he gives all these these heavy teachings, right? He gives them a a dose of, of truth. I mean, John the Apostle said Jesus was full of grace and truth sometimes, He gives you grace, and he says, all you are heavy and and burdened, come to me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You got too much pressure on yourself. You're doing too much. Just just rest in my presence. That would be an example of grace-filled teaching. Well, here, he's giving them a whole dose of truth. And everybody in the crowd, again, thousands of people are like, this is heavy. This is heavy. And I'm not even sure a lot about what Jesus is saying here. And then all of the sudden, all of a sudden, this guy who's part of the, this thousands of people speaks up and he says, probably shouts it out, there's thousands of people, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And everybody in the crowd is like, what? Did you not just hear what Jesus was talking about? And you're worried about your inheritance? Now, see, we laugh, but you've done this as well, right? You've shown up at a Sunday morning worship service, and I'm up here preaching, and you could see my mouth moving, but it's like, I'm up here, and it's like, wah, 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 because you got something going on in your life that is giving you anxiety, and you can't even hear what I'm talking about. This guy's got a whole lot of anxiety, and it's unclear exactly what's going on with this guy, but probably... His dad just passed away, and he gives his entire inheritance to his one son and leaves the other son with nothing. And if that happened to you, you would be burned as well. And he doesn't hear anything that Jesus talks about. And now that he has this opportunity, because in those days you would go to rabbis and you would say, can you settle this with me? Apparently, he wasn't able to get a rabbi to settle it with me, but he's thinking Jesus is the greatest rabbi. Clearly, he's got thousands of people here listening to him. Jesus, can you deal this? Deal with this for me. And Jesus replied, (laughs) Jesus is so smart. He's so amazing. You should read the Bible and hear what Jesus had to say. Here's what he says. Man. Now, I don't know if he's like, come on, man. Or if he's like, man. His tone was probably a little more calmer than that because Jesus was typically a lot more patient than I was. Jesus says, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Like, I'm not here to, to settle your case. I know you're burdened, but I'm not going. And he's, he, this is so amazing. Jesus says something that is so offensive to this guy who's just struggling, right? He says this, watch out. Be on your, and there's our word guard, right? Guard your heart against all kinds of greed because greed comes in all kinds of different 
forms, money, treasure, time. Be on your card. Watch out. Apparently, Jesus knows inside this guy's heart that he's wrestling with greed. And in this moment, he's worried about stuff. And Jesus says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And here's the truth. Some of you know this to be true because you've tried to get life from possessions. You've tried to upgrade and get more influence and get more stuff and get higher ceilings and bigger vehicles. And when you get it, you're like, hmm, that's all there is to it? And you have experienced that life, that real abundant life does not come from more stuff. And then Jesus, as he often does, gives a parable. Gives a parable, and, and here's what he says. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. Now, if you're a farmer living in that world, you know that if you get a bumper crop or you get extra, it's not necessarily because you did a great job. It's because God sent the rains and allowed you to get extra. So this guy has extra. He's been blessed. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to share my crops. I've got extra, and now he's in a predicament. He doesn't know what he's going to do with his extra. Now, let me just kind of poke in your life for a second. How often do we go to God with things that we need? Like, God, I've got a financial issue. Can you bless me? I've got a health issue. Can you bless me? I've got a marriage issue. Can, be, can you bless me? But how often do we go to God and say to him, God, you've already blessed me. What do you want me to do with the extra? Well, this man ends up saying to himself, it's mine because I've earned it, got it in my hands. So he comes up with a plan. He says, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones and there I will store all my grain in my goods. And some of the people in the crowd who don't know how this ends are thinking to themselves, that sounds like a great plan, right? You got extra. You don't know what to do with the extra. Tear down the barns, build bigger barns, and you'll be good. You'll be safe. And then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And some of the people in the crowd are thinking, that sounds like a good idea. I'll, I got extra, I'll store it away, and I can spend the next 30 years playing golf. And then Jesus says, again, this is so offensive. Jesus says, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And the answer to that question is somebody else. And then Jesus says, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Now, I hope that this is convicting. I hope that this is getting you to sort of examine yourself. And I came up with a question that I think is worth asking, because if Jesus is right about this, which I think he is, then we should ask the following question. How much should I give to ensure that I am rich towards God? Because I don't don't want to be called a fool. I want to be rich towards God. So how much do I need to give to ensure that I'm not going to be a fool. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I don't like that question. I don't like when you put a number on it because it's not about how much I give. It's about my heart. But here's the problem. Your heart deceives you. And there are moments where you feel generous and there are moments where you feel greedy. And there are moments when you're up and there are moments when you're down because your heart deceives you. So even though some people will say this, don't follow your heart. So I like to come back to this question, how much should I give to ensure that I am rich towards God? Now, if you grew up in church or you've been around church for years, 
you've probably heard of the word tithe, right? Which is the Hebrew word meaning 10%. Maybe you grew up in a church that said you need to, to tithe, and it comes from this Old Testament principle that's described in Leviticus chapter 27. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. So if you're living in ancient Israel during biblical times, you are required to give a tenth of everything. And it got even more sophisticated than that. You were required to take your firstborn male offspring, whether it was an animal, um, and figure out how much it was worth and add that to it. You had to give uh, free will offerings. You had to give a temple tax. Some people would even give money to the community so that they could erect these local synagogues because they only went to the temple three times a year with their baskets of grain in their hands and they would give it to the Levites to support the work of the temple. And some of you heard that principle that you should tithe, but here's my belief on that. We're no longer under the Old Testament law, right? The Apostle Paul says that you have been released from the law that we are no longer under the law. The book of Hebrews says that the law is obsolete, so we are no longer required to tithe. And you couldn't follow the Old Testament law even if you wanted to because there's no temple, there's no Levite, and most of us aren't willing to give up bacon and pork, okay? But here's the question I want to kind of get you to think about. This picture right here is a computer-generated picture of what it may have looked like for you to live in a home during Bible times. And if God expected a poor Israelite to tithe, do you think he expects less of us wealthy Americans, wealthy internationally speaking? So I'm not under the tithe. I'm not under the Old Testament law. But if we use that as an excuse to give less, I mean, Jesus would oftentimes raise the bar. Like he would say, you've heard what was said, do not murder. But I tell you, if you, even, if you even hate your brother, you've committed murder. You've heard it was said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you even look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery. See, Jesus took the law and he raised the bar. So I'm not under the law, but we should never use that as an excuse to be less generous. Now, let me speak to a certain, certain group here. Some of you who are, this is your church family, right? When you come here on a Sunday morning or you drop your kids off at youth group, you don't think this consciously, but you might think this subconsciously. Oh, I got a nice parking space. Walk through the doors. There's air conditioning. The electricity's on. I got a nice children's church check-in system for my kids to go and take their next steps towards Jesus. I come in here, there's, the lights are on, there's a sound system. You know, Pastor Dave is doing okay because he could buy himself a new pair of shoes last night. Life must be good. And you have thought this to yourself. Church doesn't need my money. Clearly, they don't need my money. I got to tell you something. Listen up. That's true. I'll take it a a step further. God doesn't need your money. Here's what what the scriptures say. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything. This original Hebrew word, everything, you know what it actually, you know what it means? It means everything. (laughs) Everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Wealth and honor, wealth and influence, wealth and followers, wealth and power. It all comes from you. That's why when we say it's all mine, it's come into my hands, I've earned it, I got the degree, I got up early, I stayed late. Who gave you the ability to produce wealth in the first place? It all comes from God. So the church doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your money, but he wants your heart. And he knows that one of the best ways to get your heart It's through your treasure. That's why he says where your treasure is, your heart will follow. If you say, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, and you're giving barely anything with your time and your treasure, that's just lip service. If you want to find out where your passion is, you need to look no further than how you spend your money and how you spend your time. So I ask you this question again. How much should I give to ensure that I am rich towards God? And the answer to this question is this. 
You get with God and you get led by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit knows exactly what's going on inside of you. He knows everything about you and he loves you so much to speak to you, to, to let you know how much that you're supposed to give. And, and typically what, what the Holy Spirit does is he nudges us outside of our comfort zone. Now, God may ask you to give less. He may say, you're giving too much, you're, you're serving too much, I don't know. But you gotta get with God and allow him to speak to you in terms of how much you should give. Now, I'm a local church pastor, so you would expect me to say this, but I, 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 I make no apologies. I think that you should give first, save second, and live on the rest. And I think that if this is your local church family, that you should give to your local church first, right off the top. Galatians 6, Paul says this, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I think that this local church should be your number one priority. And I think spontaneous giving is good, but systematic giving changes the world. You know, feeling guilty and giving to this, or your people are raising money for this, and th- this. spontaneous giving is good, but systematic giving is what runs the church. Systematic giving is what changes the world. Now, some of you right now, you're a little bit worried about that because you're like, I don't know, I, I want to buy this new thing and I want to go here. And, and this, this, is, this is what you're thinking. You're like, I don't know, kind of worried about that. And Jesus is so smart. He's so smart because it's almost like he anticipates that emotion because the very next thing he says after giving this parable of the barns, he says this, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. I got this. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it for the pagan world or those who don't follow Jesus. They run after such things and your father knows that you need them. See, for some of us, it's like, I, I, I got this, this need to have more and everything that comes into my hands is for me because I need to upgrade and I need to feel good about myself. And some of you have tried that and you've discovered that that's not how you find life. That's not what you really need. What you need is peace and love from your heavenly father. So he says, sell your possessions and and give to the poor and provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. And then he makes this statement I think is so powerful, and Jesus probably said this statement as he traveled up, up and down the, you know, from Galilee to Jerusalem. He says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wherever you put your time and your energy and wherever you put your money, that is where your passions lie. So don't wait until your heart feels like giving. Giving reduces greed just as exercising reduces stress. I mean, we know this. Like, you, you don't sit at home and go, I'm just going to wait until my heart gets healthy and my heart rate gets up and then I'll start exercising. Because you know it's the exercise that improves your heart condition. In the same way, you don't sit there and say, well, once I get this job and once I get this income and once everything's good, look, you cannot plan for every eventuality. You're not gonna be able to pay for your kid's college. Just embrace that, okay? Ain't happening. And you're not gonna be able to cover all of the, I mean, life is so unsure, right? So give, practice giving, which is the antidote to greed. Jesus said, here's how you find life, right? A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions, that it actually is better to give than to receive. So be generous. Don't just feel generous, because feeling generous never changed the world. Actually being generous is what changes the world. And if I could get super specific, 
I want to challenge you to be, become an automated percentage giver to your local church family. Because when you do things automated, it protects those moments where you're feeling greedy. And you will actually become generous. And if you do it through online giving, you go to beartownroad.org and you set up online giving, it makes the life of our financial people easier because it just goes straight from account to account. So, you up for this? I mean, if you were in the crowd that day, thousands of people, and Jesus said this, would he look at you, and I ask myself this question, and we look at me, and would he say, you're being foolish. You have mistakenly believed that life can be found in possessions. But there's a better way to do this. And the only way that you get, especially in the culture in which we live, where there are message after message after message that is more, 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 upgrade, 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 get your kids in every single activity so that you wear yourselves out and you don't have any money, giving provides the antidote, the only antidote to greed. The last thing I want to say is church leaves the building is next week. There are no services in this room. If you show up to church, you'll be outside washing cars and uh, handing out school supplies to people. We still have 140 open spots. The community is expecting us to show up. Don't go to bed tonight. I'm serious. Don't lay your head down on your pillow tonight until you sign up for spot. I get it. If you're on vacation, you have a previous commitment, you're not able to do it. But if you don't have a commitment... Please sign up so that we can tell the community that we're here for them, that we're not against them, but we are for them. Because let's be honest, some of you, you're pretty good with your money. You're generous with your money. But it's time that you become even more generous with your time. So I want to give you a moment to just be silent right now and just let this word sink in. Maybe it means you need to confess a sin to God that you've been too greedy, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, and then after that, we'll move to the next part of our service. Take a moment to be still and silent before the Lord. Amen. You know, I was thinking about <clears throat> several years ago when we as a church did some upgrades to our facility, and we attached the gym to this main space, and the cost of it was like a million dollars, you know? And I, I mean, I grew up using food stamps and having holes in my clothes before holes were cool. And I remember saying to Woody, one of the leaders who was the leader of this, what we called the REACH project, I'm like, can we like just make it simpler, like make it smaller? He listened to me. And then he said, this, this is what we need to do. And some of you were here, you know, several years ago when we paid off that mortgage in no time at all. We even have this little, you know, there are good scars Right, and you got this good scar right here because we burned the mortgage to the point where we almost burned the church down and we had to like stomp it out. <laughs> but I think back to that time and I think, you know, God has always provided in the past. And most people don't grow, go broke because they gave away too much. Most people go broke because they spend too much. And God has always provided in the past. He's provided for me, even as a kid growing up using food stamps, just his amazing provision. He's provided for you. He's provided for his church. And he's going to provide in the future. He is a faithful God. And so I believe God's leading us to start a third service this fall. And I know there's some trepidation around that. I know God's going to provide. He's done it in the past. He'll do it again. And as we look at building upgrades and maybe doing something to the facility, we're still trying to figure that out. God's going to provide. He always has. So let's be people who practice generosity.